I'm an industrial, industrial designer. I teach at Victoria University. Um, I know Kate and Brian, and we have some clear synergies that we haven't, I'm not going to talk about them here today too much, but which we are growing. I think um, when Kate mentioned 3D printing, which is where we use our small machines to basically print the design straight out of a computer, and a machine will just build it, is typically how we make now. The days of actually going downstairs and crafting things with tools for designers is over. And that's, there's a synergy between that and how the body grows. Now, do you want me to stand beside anywhere in particular here? Okay. Right. Um, this is just an introductory slide here. It's really about how I got, came into contact with people like clinicians, the health industry, etc. I wasn't an academic. I was working in private practice. I met up with some anaesthetists. Is there any anaesthetists here? Just before I make really good comments about them, or bad comments. Um, and we developed an endoscope trainer for really teaching people how to use one of these scopes when they have to go down, in emergency cases, into people's lungs. And we wanted to develop a device which would help them in dexterity, not in clinical skills. And this is really about working with clinicians. I work with simulation experts, etc., to try and come up with this concept here. And this was a little pathway where people would put their scopes through. Through that process, that design process of coming up with a product, I met up with this fellow, Brian Robinson, and I met up with that object there, the anaesthesia machine. And that's, so I'm going from where you've been at quite small scale, I'm going to large scale and sort of coming at a sort of completely different angle here. And I want to talk about cultivating a convention of use. Designed at the sharp end. Now this is right inside theatre. After working on the projects with anaesthetists, I became really interested in this area and wanted to take this further. And so I spent probably three years on this project of looking at a really big medical device. And so what I'm going to do today really is take you on a very fast journey about how a device comes around, its reason for being in some ways. Um, this is the story of a lineage and this convention of use, of habits, and how we use things and how they impart themselves into an object. So this is my little road map here first, and it goes right back from the mechanical era of the 1900s right up to now, current day digital era. Right in the early days, we've got a big band of anaesthetists innovating. And this could come to other people that are involved in theatre, surgeons, etc. Um, over the period of time, this notion of people who are working at the sharp end, innovating, has really reduced. And it's reduced a lot because of regulations and safety. Although they are very good advisors, the communication between designers and these people needs to be exceptional these days. Okay, so to begin this journey, the journey of anaesthesia in some ways, and objects of design. We look at this um, image here. This is a handkerchief or a rag, and what the anaesthetist would do is they'd soak some chloroform into it or drop it on, lay it over the patient's face and knock them out. Yep, pretty rough. It's personal knowledge. Only they would know how to do it. They would know how many drops to put on, how to fold that cloth, etc. So the whole notion of how a piece of equipment is used is within them. Going along a little bit further, this notion of innovation and making comes from the user, and in this case, the anaesthetist. And this is from the 1860s, and it's a little chloroform mask. And what's really beautiful about this object is that it's a piece of fabric, folded piece of wire with a little handle on it. Now that piece of design not only accounts for the task, but the activity. The handle folds up, the fabric folds down, he pops it under his top hat, jumps on his horse, rides off to his client. This is before hospitals. So that's design from the user embodied in an object for the complete activity. Very nice piece. So we move along in our story of design coming about to where anaesthetists are making small devices. They're out in their garages, building things, soldering things together, trying to work out calculations of volumes of gases, etc. Constructing. 
they're designing around themselves. And this comes into the sort of area of ergonomics and how we use things. And no matter how digital the world becomes, until we are little blobs sitting there doing nothing, we're still going to have to deal with objects and figure out how to use them. So this is the little narrative from the 1860s all the way through to the 1920s of the evolution of the anaesthesia machine. And it's gone from this very much a sort of closed personal use up to a sort of boxed object. And this is people designing around themselves designing for their own spaces. Now, when I was going through this investigation, I was thinking, so, as it grew along, and it got to a stage in the 1920s where it was this little box, and this was the advent of hospitals. Gas. And then we got to this device here, by the same guy, Boyles, and we got a little table on it. And I was fascinated how we made these jumps and what caused them. And when I read this little notion up here to say that it's like this, because the fellow was left-handed, makes me think about saying, was everyone left-handed? Oh, I didn't think they were. My parents told me no. So what I did was I traced back, I went over to a lot of museums in Australia, went through a lot of archive to try and figure out this notion of what was normal use. How were people using equipment? And these photographs demonstrate quite clearly that everyone was left-handed. And all the famous people were left-handed, and their devices were left-handed. Yes. No, they were right-handed. It's a myth, and we can get sucked in by these myths as designers. We have to be very careful. And that's why I think it's interesting for people involved in the design world to really have a good knowledge of what happened in the past. So what I'd say here is over a period of time, we've cultivated awkwardness. This is the very early handheld turn of the century when an anaesthetist was working on a patient like this, just around themselves. They designed it themselves. Early hospital, small apparatuses, still quite close, and they're transferring their use methods. Current day practice, the workstation, it's got bigger and bigger and bigger, it's moved further away from the user, this is the patient in blue, and so we've cultivated awkwardness. Um, we look at some current sort of studies, or some past studies, to say, has anybody questioned this? This sort of lineage of innovation and how awkward these machines have become. 1973, by 1973, the anaesthesia machine was a Christmas tree. It was a tabletop, it was a piece of furniture with a whole lot of new, innovative gadgets strapped all over it. 1973, this fellow does a study, and he uses quite high-tech methods. He uses motion tracking with his eye, etc. 2004, another study using motion tracking again. 1973, this fellow Dury finds the workplace awkward and it should be redesigned. Exactly the same in 2004. Again, it's a question of when you're researching to go back a little bit earlier. Two studies, huge space in between, exactly the same findings. We go back and have a look at the use methods of where someone's doing a study currently over in Brisbane. And just notice the way this was personal use, nice and close, handheld, observe the patient. This is heads up display. They're not observing the patient anymore, they're observing the display. It's a very interesting study, and we're still trying to find ways past the status quo in the convention. We can't have people going to the operating theatre and say, hey mate, I made this, I'm just going to stick it on here. It'll be cool. It'll work. You know, solder those wires on. Doesn't happen. So where's the innovation? These are the machines as they currently are. And it's really interesting to note that both of these machines were really designed in the early 80s. And it's current day stuff. It's a very slow moving piece of equipment. But look at the way they show, and this is the brochure shots. They're beautiful objects by industrial designers. But this is how they used, and this is the reality check of when you're embarking on these sorts of things of saying, oh, I've got a bright idea. Just check. Because this is where the innovation actually happens. Because the anaesthetist is in here doing his work, and they just used it. What this is is all about design deficiencies of the product. It's covered. How many packets of gloves do you need? You know? I don't know. Do they come in 10 different sizes? How much crap is there? 
Hold on, that's the paper, man. I've got a bet on number 10. To this. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 screens. The innovation happens within. What about design? Where's the industrial designer been? They've been busy. They've had great ideas. They've done the studies. They've done the ergonomics analysis. And they've figured out some great answers. And they've come up with some beautiful products. And they've spent huge amounts of money. And this is just a range of them. It's commonly, this is what happens. They don't follow the t conventions of use. Though these conventions aren't perfect, they break away and say, we have the answer. And they design machines, costing millions, where it comes into theatre and someone says, where's the front? Which way around did it go? This is a Siemens Kion, two years, and it was finished. And they moved out of that field. Very expensive exercise. And that's really designer-centred stuff. As designers, we're thinking we know best. And this is a need for communication against, amongst all parties. So I continued this study. I actually went and did a lot of work in theatre just observing and building up relationships with the clinical team. And it's fascinating to just sort of see how people use this. When you first walk in, it looks like chaos. After a couple of weeks, it seems normal. And you start to understand the difficulties. But also look at this image and just, you can read it. There's design questions everywhere. And everyone looks tired. And we're leaning on things that are really, really important, like infusion pumps. <laughs> the theatre is a busy place. Designing in this area, you may have a great idea about this sort of stuff. It's complex. And it tends to become like the cowboys and Indians and the covered wagons are drawn into a circle as they draw equipment around themselves and sort of end up in the middle of it. Now from that, what was really good about my, um, this study was that I built up a relationship with these group of clinicians. And I invited them into a series of prototyping exercises where I said, if we have a convention, can we challenge it? What would you like if you went out and designed a machine? Would they all make the same thing? Or would we have different stuff? So really this was a method of a designer to work with people. I wasn't in there with them, but we used very simple materials. And they prototyped equipment in the simulation centre here at Capital Coast. Excuse me. Um, most of them did it in an hour to two hours. They had to make a machine out of polystyrene and bits of stick, etc., which would feasibly work. And through the simulation scenario, if it didn't, they had to go back and make it work. They could talk about whatever technology they wanted to use. They could use future tech. Um, they really embraced this. And there's no studies really out there about it. It's a very qualitative study. As a designer, we tend to do a lot of this. We ended up with probably a dozen machines. Half of them were pretty much like what we had. Where people had gone in there and just done the program, did the prototyping and came out. I'm happy. The other half were really complex. Very, very different. And they went back almost to the 1920s. All of them were very small, all of them were very digital, and all of them were like little transformer boxes. So it's a fascinating study about what we end up with. Now, this is pretty much the end of it. What can we do with that? Now, I've taken these studies to GE in the States, I've taken it to the States, etc. And this piece of equipment is so complex and it's stuck in this convention. If you design anything different, the risk is so high. The only way I think we can approach these sorts of things of change is we actually need to communicate more with the client base. If you Googled future anesthesia machine in, you probably wouldn't get any results. It's not like the car industry where we know in 10 years we'll probably be driving electric cars. So we've got to start to communicate with the clients, with the clinicians, earlier through concepts that can lead them into things. 